this session sort of came about when I, you know, I'm, I'm not that self-reflective, but from time to time, I'd be working alongside another developer or, you know, something would come up in the middle of the day and I'd just jump right into a live system. And occasionally I'd take a step back and it would occur to me to say, you know, if I didn't know what I was doing, this could be really dicey. And so I started, and I don't know how well known some of this knowledge is. So I started jotting things down as they occurred to me. It's like, oh, don't ever do this or make sure if you have to do that, do these two other things first. And so I just started collecting them as I went along. Um, you, if you haven't met I, JJ, I, JJ a San Diego born and raised local San Diego boy, as am I. And so we're pretty excited to talk about the best food in San Diego. So hopefully you've brought your stomachs or maybe hopefully you've already eaten because if you haven't, Today's Christine, stream we can hear you. you hungry. If you're on the live stream, I look forward to hanging out with y'all, hearing what you think about what some of your favorite foods. <laughs> Edwards and Zoom calls. <laughs> uh, Chris, you'll have to unmute again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. So anyway, I just wanted to start collecting these. And then it occurred to me that all of you might have, you know, a different set of facts in your head. So I want this to be, you know, nothing is absolute, right? Everything in FileMaker um, always boils down to it depends. So um, I, I would like to approach this as kind of an open discussion. I'll, I'll throw out what uh, has occurred to me and what my thoughts are, and then just feel free to chime in. So, you know, updates from San Diego aside, I think everybody should feel free to just jump in here. I don't need to hold questions to the end or anything like that, but uh, um, let's get into it. So first off, I think FileMaker, you know, way back in its origin time was fundamentally different from most programming environments. Most things you would write some code and compile it and deploy it. And so there was no working on live code. You know, you had to compile stuff to deploy it. And so we didn't know any better, you know, 20, 30 years ago when we first got started. I think a lot of FileMaker developers are self-taught and uh, many of them don't come from the discipline of other coding environments. And so um, this is just how we worked. We, we needed something done. Somebody needed a new report. You just jumped on and did it. And over time, uh, there's been the realization that there are best practices and that there are developer uh, ops uh, frameworks and paradigms and good practices and things like that. And it has occurred to people that maybe that's not the best way to do things. Um, some people, you know, I think the whole separation model sort of grew out of that where someone had a system deployed and they couldn't work on a live system. Maybe they had to go on site to do so. And so it was very inconvenient to uh, work on a live system. And so they would work on a UI file that they would just sort of drop onto a data file and the data could keep running. And then their UI would update every time they, you know, put a new UI file into the system. And, you know, there are other reasons. And you could say that FileMaker developers are lazy and it's just easier to work on a live system as it is to have a test and uh, a dev system, a test system, then push to live deployment. Sometimes there are emergencies and someone says, this feature that we thought was working is broken and it's actually causing harm. You need to fix this immediately. And that's always a defensible action. You know, if you need to kick all the users out of the system for five minutes, no one's going to question that. But I mean, there's also other things like timeliness for those of us who do this professionally and get paid to do it. Um, I think your velocity in terms of features per hour worked is faster if you're working directly on a live system than if you're working on an offline system and then maybe go through a few iterations um, and then push it live. That just is a more cumbersome process. And it's not just that it's quicker to do it this way. Um, there's also this question, and I don't know how else to phrase it, but developer cognitive load. If you have a relatively simple feature and you have to think, okay, here I am in this dev system, I do this, I need to follow these steps, and then I push it to this, and we get some acceptance testing, then I push it live. That's a lot more to keep in mind 
for a developer who may have, you know, dozens of balls in the air every day that they're trying to keep track of. And so it's just more mental effort to do things other than, you know, working on the live system. So to me, reducing the developer's cognitive load is a, a valid reason to do this. Um, and the next to last bullet point here, vague spec. Um, I don't know about you, but a lot of the um, clients I've worked with over the years don't know exactly what they want. And so it tends to be a really iterative process where they say, I want this feature and you build it and you say, that's great, but it's not quite what I wanted. I want to do this. And so if you have a lot of iteration, literally sculpting the feature as you go in real time with the client, and especially if th there's a very oddball use case that only exists in the live system at the moment, it's a brand new record or brand new scenario that just popped up and you don't have that data in your dev system, it's a lot more of a burden to go, okay, we have to recreate this exact unicorn situation in our dev system that's problematic and it's cumbersome to do. And so it's much simpler to, and you can fork in live code. It's you know not uh, traditional forking, but it's possible to do in FileMaker. And so um, it's possible to have, have your cake and eat it too, and really have sort of uh, a forked bit of code or a forked script working with the live data that is the exact use case that uh, the client wants addressed. And so I, I think for any or all of these reasons, it, it's valid to work on live code. And so um, and I, I think a lot of us do that. And maybe there's a, a best practice or a safer practice, but I think you can sort of mitigate the risk as you go. And I'll touch on that in a second here. So what are the considerations that you should keep in mind when you sort of make the decision that yes, it's safe to do this or no, it would be better if I you know, at least waited till after hours and did it offline or something like that. And so the sort of factors that I weigh and you guys might all have different things that you weigh are how many people are we talking about? You know, If you do something that stops the show, how many people are you gonna suddenly throw out of work? Um, you know, if you have 100, 200 users and you break the system and bring it down, you've just stopped the productivity of a bunch of people. That's an expensive mistake. And so part of the calculation that I do is how big an impact would a mistake in this action cause. And so also, if there are other developers working in the system alongside you, you might be stopping their work as well, or you might bump heads with them. If you have two people jostling to get into the managed database dialogue, that can be problematic. And so there's all this, it's almost like a dance, you know, you sort of figure out here are all these things, you know, there's worrying machinery over here. I have another developer over here trying to get something done. And to some extent, the answer isn't if, but when. It's like, I need to do this thing, but I have to wait for this person over here to finish what they're doing. And these people are running their end of month uh, uh, reporting. I don't want to disrupt that at all. And so let me find a quiet time or at least a low impact time to make this change. And, you know, I, I think that holds true for non-urgent fixes, but for urgent fixes, everything's out the window. So all bets are off. Um, and then obviously, do I have to get into manage database and make a schema change or not? If I'm just adding a brand new report, it's not even a question for me. I'm just going to dive in there and knock it in there because the impact is low. There are no elements to the new feature that current users are actually touching and working on. So they're not even gonna see the change or feel the change in any way. And so that kind of thing is a no brainer. Um, but then, you know, you might have a development environment and there might be a handful of developers working on it. So it might have at most three or four or five users on it. And you can't really easily simulate without using some uh, the simulation tools like Nick Lightbody has written, you know, the system seems to be behaving differently under load. So there are some cases where you really have to be on the live system to say, you know, this is really laggy for the users, works great in dev, I can't simulate the same circumstances, so I need to do it now. And especially if it's a particularly busy time of day when everybody comes into the office, you know, if they do anymore and uh, jumps onto the system at a similar time. Sometimes you have to stress the system to recreate a problem or reproduce something that you need to address. 
Um, and then the other thing is, you know, speed of deployment If somebody, you know, I've been in situations where some uh, executive is about to walk into a board meeting. It's like, I need these numbers now. I need this report now. And in the case of um, speed of implementing the feature, sometimes it's just not even a question. You just have to do it. Uh, even if you may be inconveniencing some users, it's like, well, it's going to lock records for these people. We're going to have to kick them out. And sometimes they just don't care. It's like, yes, disrupt my team for 20 minutes while you do this thing for me. And then obviously there are, are emergency situations. Um, I came up with this one. It, this was in the news a couple of weeks ago. Uh, BlockFi, which is a crypto lender, accidentally... Um, made a code change that said, if I wanted $77 worth of Bitcoin, it would give me 77 Bitcoin. And so tens of millions of dollars mistakenly had outflows. And so you can bet they didn't do very rigorous testing. They probably shut that thing down immediately and disrupted their users. And so sometimes if you have a crisis, you just have to do it. Um, and I didn't want to make any other point other than, uh, you know, sometimes th things just go bad. So if you do have to do this, um, and again, for like a, adding a brand new report with a brand new table, it's not gonna disrupt anything, but anything else where you might be impacting users, especially if you have to touch data and not just code, um, you know, I think it's always a great idea to do an ad hoc backup of the system right before you start. So. Worst case scenario, you can roll back and maybe people would lose a few minutes of work. Um, if you're modifying a layout, I always like to duplicate a layout in the live system, tinker around in there, maybe put a hidden button somewhere so that the user who requested the feature can navigate to it and test the feature out and say, yes, that works, and then just sort of slide it live. Um, and so internal forking is something I tend to do both with layouts and with scripts in a live system to uh, a, be uh, least disruptive, and B, allow the requester to actually test the change before I make it available to everybody. Um, any questions or comments at this point, or is everybody going, yeah, that's sort of how we do it? Okay. So the next steps gets into. Uh, can, I, yeah. can I comment? Yeah, feel free. Uh, Actually, uh, Danny and me, we are uh, working together on a, on a system where we have a development environment. And uh, actually, what you are saying is completely true. Everything is true. But we kind of mix this, this setup. I mean, we sometimes do life changes, and we sometimes do uh, changes in the development environment. If we do life changes, we do them twice. So we do them live and in the development environment. Yeah. Yeah. And then we deploy afterwards. So everything which is a bug, everything which is like short scripts and stuff, we tend to do double. But everything which is like field definitions is like off the table. I mean, uh, off the table because of file makers uh, serial number thing where people cannot make records anymore when you go into the field definitions. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. So you, you cannot change field definitions. That's like a that's like an enormous risk unless you change everything to UUIDs or UUID numbers. I mean, you can simply not do it because you were make your database corrupt. The worst one is when you change a field definition and forget that there's a million records in the file. <laughs> Good thing that's never happened to any of us, huh? So, yeah, you're so good. Uh, Peter, I would yeah, actually well, agree with you about uh, changing schema on a live system. If I'm adding in a brand new table that, you know, there's no data for or anything like that, it's a new feature and I haven't spun the module up not live yet, I have no problem going into managed database, uh, modifying fields in that table. And there having might be, but there might be an impact if you for some reason, copy a field, some calculation or uh, automate data enter field from another table that has indexing already set and you paste into a new database, then, well, it will start working and crawl your file maker to a halt. So. 
even so that's that you copy and paste an index field from a live table to the new table that will cause a lock? Yeah, I, I had that many times when I didn't just disable all the indices when pasting and then clicking OK and then finally I started calculating because the field when I copied it was already indexed. So it thought of, well, you said I was indexed, so I'll just build my index now. Right. And this is not I, I would think that helpful. would have minimal impact if it was an empty table though, wouldn't it? If it's completely empty, yes. But if you if you just populate the table and then you think, well, I copied that field in and I see, yeah. yeah. Can I can I comment on that? Actually, in the file, as soon as you go into field definitions, you're taking the whole serial number scheme as a hostage. You you you, yeah. you are you are blocking the whole serial number scheme for it's every it's possible table in that file. Because so every possible table, excuse me, every possible, possible table in that file okay. becomes locked. The serial number scheme because it's in your definitions. Those definitions do not change while you have them open because you just block them. So they only become available again when you click OK and you submit the scheme again, which means that nobody can make a record using a serial number. Imagine that. Yeah. Um, that you, can, you, can look, you can look at the list of fields. You can look at the list of fields. You can change to every table and look at the list of fields. But the moment you open the options dialog, or a calculation. Or the moment you go into a calculation, the table you're in is yeah. is locked. In fact, in, as soon as your FRG becomes gray when somebody else looks at it, then you have changed something, and then you have completely locked it. Yeah, but is it the table you're in, or is it all the tables of the file? That's that's the question. It's I the have. complete file. You're you're blocking the file, which is logical because you just loaded the complete scheme into your memory. Okay. Shit. That that has not been my experience. If I say make a brand new table in an existing file, a live file, all the other tables, the serial numbers seem to be generating properly. I haven't had any sort of disruption to that when I'm working in sort of new ground inside. Well, Chris, Chris, just imagine the moment I'm loading the field definitions and I'm looking at the serial number. This serial number does not change on my screen while I'm looking at it. It doesn't change dynamically while somebody is creating a record in the file. So right, as soon as somebody creates a record in the file, as soon as somebody creates a record in the file, while I have the field definitions open, how does that work? Because as soon as I submit it, I will force that serial number scheme again into, this, into, into the field definition. Correct, correct, is that but true? only for the is table that, that you is touch. That Every table that you touch, yeah. Every I table think it's, where you open the yeah, the yeah, uh, an options, so it's when you open the options. And if you if you're looking at serial numbers, then you have to open the options to see the serial number, and that is the action which blocks the table. So it's like uh, um, it's like, like it's like it's like when you're editing when you just when you're just uh, in a like, in a field on a layout, you can be in the field and you're not so yet like, blocking the record. It's as like soon Schrodinger's as you press a button, cat. then you're blocking the record, and it's similar with the um, fields. It's like Schrodinger's cat. As soon as you look at the cat, if it's dead or alive, it's the collapse of the wave function. Yeah. <laughs> so what about yeah, not using? So what if? What about if people are not using serial numbers? Any impact? There there was, you can't. You can't the, create records. Yeah, you can't create seen. records at all. Can you? You can create oh, records. Exactly. You, 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 you can. The only time you run into a problem with a auto enter field not filling in when you create a record is if you do the you wait till commit to do those serial numbers. But it's only serial numbers that it affects. Yeah. So if you have the right, if you have the table locked and it waits till commit to create the serial number, new records created will get a blank uh, serial number. Other than that, everything still works. Well, or if you have worse, the record not worse. empty, then yes. <laughs> if even you have the serial number when, two, yes, sorry. Even worse is when you have you want to add a field or change a little thing, and then having done that, you then try and uh, save the change, and you can't save the change because a user has currently got a record open. 
Yeah. And when a user has got a record open, you cannot change anything. You cannot save yeah. it. So I've had situations where I've tried to put <laughs> add fields to, to tables. And some user has gone to, th gone to lunch and left a record open, and then you can forget it. You can't, you can't do any changes. Yeah. So you, would you really take that risk? Which risk? Well, changing the seal definitions, it seems like you bring yeah. Russian roulette with your database. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's a good game. It's, you know, it gives you a buzz. <laughs> but, but the user gets a warning that he cannot create a record, so no. there's no real risk. No, he does not. If you have a script running and you say allow user board offset error capture on, then the user does, doesn't get anything. So uh, okay. in the case, if you if you have set the database definitions that um, the serial number field must not be empty. Uh -huh. The record isn't even created. So if you don't catch the error clause after the new record, you overwrite his existing record, which is the most important part of it. And for that reason, we um, don't use new record or duplicate record anymore in any scripts. We have a script for creating a new record and we have a script for duplicating a record. And we only use these two scripts. And in these two scripts, we check uh, the error to yeah. see if it's uh, worked. And if it hasn't worked, um, we have a pause function uh, that it retries after a short time. And it tries and tries and tries. And if after a period it can't do anything, then um, we prefer to stop the current uh, process rather than overwriting other, other records. So we, we, we can totally bomb out. It happens very rarely, um, and it's, it stops writing, so it, uh, writing it over other, you, other records, which is impossible to debug. It, it brings you to the situation where for every script step you make, you have to make an additional three script step to check if everything went right with your script step. Oh, yes, that's fun. Don't you use single pass loops? Of course. Exit loop on error, yeah, sure. Yeah. But that's also, you need an exit loop script step after each script step that actually does something. Yeah, but it's it makes it much easier to do it than the other way around. Uh, but I mean, back to what Chris was saying, because I think I and I think a few others are also kind of like a little bit skeptical about Chris, your conclusion maybe, <laughs> because you seem to be like on the side of more like development, though I must say that you listed a lot of very good arguments of what we are missing out on because we're not doing it. Yeah. And I think productivity for sure. And also, I mean, these fussy users who don't know what they want and all. I mean, those are really very good reasons where live development for sure has advantages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, Jan, did you I, have I think, a. Uh, I think, uh, sorry. I think that uh, using a development environment is, is, is forcing your customer to become more mature about development. Yeah. It, uh, it's like something, it's in, not in your slide as an, as an advantage of doing live development. In your slide is not, one of the reasons is that customers are not simply not having the setup to have a development environment. They only have their live server. They're already very happy they have a FileMaker server. So let alone they have a development server. Uh, so, but if you force a development server on them, you force them to test what is made. And a lot of customers are not ready for that. I find so it's the, getting the a little site licensing easy. model makes that really easy though. If you have like a 50 seat site license, you can have 50 servers. So it costs nothing, you know, other than a VM or, you know, a hardware box to set up a dev server. So it's, it's not as burdensome to do so as it used to be. No, it's right. Yeah, but in your subscription, you can always uh, have three servers. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, use the developer subscription. Yeah, but there's of course some additional stuff like uh, talking, sending mails from FileMaker uh, should not happen from the development environment, for example. Uh, couplings with ODBC or with the website, uh, whatever external connections you have from your environment shouldn't happen from the development environment unless you duplicate those systems as well, of course. Yeah, certainly yeah, and that's where we have systems are a problem. problem. Yeah, and that's where like we have everything, like the send mail script, there's only one. 
and it's wrapped in a function that says if you're on the development server, it either sends the mail to us or it doesn't send it all, depending on what we're doing. Uh, we That's do the right. same thing with any function that, you know, like updates to the API, like to the web server. We don't want API calls being sent to our web server when we're testing stuff. Uh, so that stuff is all disabled. It, now that's easy on a system. Obviously, you completely control. A little bit harder on a system you don't. So, Chris, carry we, on. We touched on the point. Go ahead. Carry on. Oh, okay. I thought uh, I, I was waiting for Jan to jump in here because he seemed like he wanted to. He had a point to make, but uh, me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to get back to the, the database dialogue. It's actually a lot worth when a user has a record open and leaves and you try to modify the scheme. Yes. You look out all other uh, users that try to modify records in the table later. So it's a cascade. It's not just you waiting for your user to come back. So you need to be extra careful with that. Yes. And one uh, other thing about the dialogue, if you confirm um, database dialogue on all the clients, uh, tabs and uh, sl uh, slides get reset to the default tab. So that's re again something you don't want uh, your users to see in production because they get confused. They don't understand what's going on. and if your tabs are actually programmatically controlled, you end up in a situation that is out of the control of your script. One second, what, what gets reset? All your or tabs. 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 tabs and panels. And panels, yeah. There, there are also a few situations where it'll actually reset the user to their first record, which is important to know when that happens. And that is when? Uh, da Damien did a session on that a few years ago called, well, I think the title was, you never cared about the first record anyway, did you? <laughs> yeah, you create, just create a dummy first record on each table and uh, that one's flagged especially. And, you know, you know, so. Josh, do you want to elaborate on the situations when it jumps to the first record? Not right now, no. <laughs> it's been a while because we... We switched to doing a development to production migration workflow a while ago. Um, there's just certain things we never did, so we didn't run into it that often. Like our, our process when we were doing live development, if we had to make a schema change, if we were doing an addition, it was easy. We would create the fields in a, in a copy of the database and then just copy them. That way we can just open the dialogue, paste, okay, okay, okay. If we get the dialogue that somebody was editing the record, we just cancel, cancel, cancel. You know, so we were, we were ready. I mean, it, it looked like a, a firefight trying to just get that in as fast as possible and pray that one of the calculations didn't update because uh, that's usually what exactly. it was. Exactly. It's a lot of praying and burning candles. Yeah. So any changes to schema that were was already existing, we would either do early in the morning or late at night when we know nobody was on. And then it was trying to, you know, get it done before between the backups and the nightly schedules. And that's when our problems started because we work with a lot of Citrix users and lots of them do not log out of the database or even Citrix. So um, you will be blocked for infinity unless you kick them off the server and you don't know what they were doing. So fuck. We don't care. We just kicked them off anyways. If it was just hey, one. Josh, year. I've had an idea. Look, look, I can do your updates and you can do my updates. Yeah. And then we can all go to bed at the, you know, a good time. Sounds I good. have clients in, in North America, nine hour time difference means I can do live development quite often, it's fine. All right, let me mush through some of these other slides. There's a flow chart I wanna to get to here that I think will be fertile ground for further discussion. Um, this is just some basic stuff. Like we've done a lot of remote development over the years. We try to never directly connect to the FileMaker server. We always wanna remote into a client machine on the same LAN. And that way, if you know, you know, if you're on a plane, I mean, I've had situations where I got an emergency contact on a plane. I had to get on the plane Wi-Fi and connect to something. I would never connect to a live FileMaker session over that. I would connect to a client machine. That way, if the connection drops, the client machine still holding the connection to the server. 
and I can just reconnect to that and sort of pick up where I left off. So, I mean, basic common sense stuff like that. Um, yeah, and can especially- I, can, I, can I ask, can I ask, yeah, can I ask here? Um, uh, does it have to be a client client or can it be a client on the FileMaker server? No, I, I, I have often jumped on to FileMaker server. Sometimes that's the only machine we get access to. It's like, well, you're allowed to talk to the server because you have to take care of it. And so we'll install FileMaker client on that. Now, unfortunately, lately, Claris's position has been, that's a terrible practice, don't do it. Yeah. We have had situations, um, and I don't know that it was FileMaker's fault, but the server seemed a little touchy. And we fire up FileMaker, log into the server on the same machine, and within 15 minutes, it'll just fall down. You know, the server will still be running, but the session, the client session will fall down. So I think that's Claris just sort of covering their bets and making sure, well, don't, this is a known problem. There's some sort of gremlin there. Don't do it. So we don't have to deal with it. But I think the right approach would be to deal with it and make that able to work well. Yeah, uh, our 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 um, live live editing practices is, is to log into the FileMaker server and open a client there and do everything there. And we have one customer where I think it's this combination of the client on the server. It's really slow. There's some um, kind of I, I have going the on. I have the solution for you to this one because I had this as well. Don't use the Bonjour connection. Always type in the IP address before you connect to the server. If you use Bonjour, your it gets incredibly slow to connect, and okay. it's really a bad connection. So just go for local IP address, type it in, connect to that. Works perfectly. Use it Don't use it. Bonjour. Yeah, that might be it. All right, cool. Yeah, right. but Bonjour is just for finding the IP. As soon as FileMaker resolved the Bonjour name, they got the IP, and then they connect just like if you entered the IP. Yeah, but not if there is some sort of routing going on in the system, and you go out of the system and into the system and through a firewall or something like it, because okay. the IT yeah, department I've... made shit, and then, yeah. <laughs> I've seen people accessing their local server, going through the router, out on the internet, and back into the computer. <laughs> yeah, and it, that's sort of my third bullet point here, which is that sometimes the network's just misbehaving, and I try to avoid any development until that storm has calmed down, because you're just asking for trouble. All right. Moving on, here we go. So this is the flow chart I was talking about. So this is sort of the process I go through in my head when I say, okay, I got a request, how do I approach it? And so is this a schema change, yes or no? If it's not a schema change and they're changing a value list or a layout or some script, um, then I feel much happier about uh, doing it live. If it is a schema change, then the question is, is this table in active use by users? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, if I'm making a brand new table, then I have no qualms about going in there, making a table, mucking around with fields, setting up new relationships. Uh, I've had no trouble doing stuff like that. If the table is in use, uh, is it possible for me to sort of put a roadblock up to keep users out of the table? Maybe it's a little corner of the system and I can temporarily shut off navigation. Um, and keep people out of it. And if I can, I say, okay, well then I'll shut off that module for a while and do my work and then let them back in. Um, if you can't keep the users out of it, it's an actively used table and you have to make the change, then you have no choice but to bring the system down, kick all the users out, make the change as quickly as you can. And a lot of people have suggested the strategy of, you know, sort of build this thing on an offline copy or a duplicate you know, figure out all the kinks, get it ready. So it's really just a copy and paste, bring the system down, paste in your new uh, schema, you know, be they fields in an existing table or a whole new table and a set of relationships, knock them in there as fast as you can, bring it back up so that you protect the system availability as much as you can. And then I have a note in the corner there that says all resolutions may require subsequent data cleanup. And, um, and this point was also mentioned that you should always remember to replicate your live changes in the development version if you have a development version going in parallel. And so I think, um, you know, Peter mentioned they do both. They have the hybrid approach. Sometimes they work live and then they replicate in development. And that hybrid approach is the hardest to me because then you sometimes, I mean, it makes sense to do, you know, 
complex development of a substantial new feature in offline copy, but if it's a brand new feature? Um... No, we never do it with a brand new feature. Yeah. But there's even a third uh, thing that we do is like, you know, you have this problem where you, you just kicked everybody out so you can work on the database. But the problem is, as soon as the files are open on the server, everybody wants to log in. Yes. And you don't want them to log in. So we're really missing that feature in FileMaker where you can say like, okay, only people using full access can now or whatever, only people with this IP address and you have to firewall it or something. Yeah, we're gonna be we have this simple, this simple thing in the startup file that says like the system is down, which means yeah. that as soon as they, they start it up, they get like, no, the system is under maintenance. So they cannot continue starting up and we can work on the files. But why don't you put that in your start script? In, yeah, easy. because I don't see any other way to do it. But that's easily put in the start script. No problem. Yeah, but of course, it's not, do... it's not difficult to do this, but you have to do it. The other, the other thing that we've done when we really needed to keep people out, because all of our stuff is uh, externally authenticated, is to just remove the group from all the users. And then they can't log in. And then when you mean in the in the Windows authentication or something, right? Yeah, in the in the external authentic wherever, wherever you're doing it. So like if you're using Active Directory, mm. you just remove the group from all of them. <laughs> that's, so that's a little bit of a pain if you have a lot of different groups. What we um, but if you really need to keep them out, and you don't want to you don't want to alter that startup script, oh. then that's actually option. the way we oh, did maybe that just was disable maybe. external authentication then. You no. can just turn just, uh, external turn authentication off, off at just, the control. You don't have to do it group by group. You can stop right. it. Now, I'm not recommending this process necessarily, but that's the way you can do it. Stephen, great minds think alike. Uh, the, the quickest way I found was to remove the um, the FM net um, privilege from the uh, from the, the groups and then add it back once I was done. That, yes. that also so just disable the users. Just one <laughs> click, just one <laughs> click is all you have to do. An another <laughs> option is a development server. <laughs> yeah. The thinking. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit and go from you know schema changes yeah, to non-schema changes. We... So what uh, sort of things do we have there? And so to me, th these fall under valueless scripts and layouts for the most part. You could get into custom functions and things like that, but I, I think these are the, the biggies. Because it was just me. And so I... Um, and then for, you know, valueless, I'll get to in more detail in a second. Scripts, you know, it, it, you know, as always, it depends, you know, is this a script that's in active use and, you know, encodes a specific workflow? Egbert, you have a thought? Yeah, yeah, Chris, there is someone else talking in the background. Shall I unmute, unmute everyone and, uh, or is it okay with you? Um, I, I, if everyone can hear me okay, I, I have no problem with it. All right, so if a script encodes a certain procedure, you know, step one, step two, step three, and you need to modify that, then that's a different animal. But if you're adding a new capability, oh, oh it'd be nice if after we ran the report, we want to see a print dialogue so we can print it as a convenience factor, something like that. Um, I have no problem just tacking it on there and all of a sudden the user will get a surprise and like, oh, I ran the report and asked me to print. How great is that? Um, you know, that's not, well, that may be a surprise. I wouldn't call that a disruption. Uh, sometimes I do something that I call a live splice, which is where I fork the script right in the middle. It's like, well, we wanted to do A, B, and C, or it's been doing A, B, and C, but I wanted to do A, A sub one, then B and C, and something like that, or maybe, you know, ask for some filter criteria, or whatever it is. And then I will, you know, some people will do that and say, hey, if you've got the full access privilege branch to this thing, I typically like to do a uh, get active modifier keys and say, hey, if you have the shift key down and only the shift key down, then it will branch you into this new thing. And that way I'm in the live system with real data. I can go to the requester and say, hey, try clicking that button with the shift key down and try it and tell me if this works for you. And we can work it out that way. And that way all the other users running the same script will get their typical experience and my requester can get this new revised experience and we can you know, work out whatever kinks we have 
And then as soon as I'm ready to push it live, I just say, you know, if true. And so then it works for everybody. And so um, that has worked well for me for live development if I need to modify a script. An okay. alternative to the shift key, an alternative to the shift key is the caps lock key. Yeah, but some people uh, have the tax lock key down by mistake. And so I try to avoid those people. I want it to be very deliberate. You you know, most people aren't going to hold the shift key down while they're running a button or pushing a button. So to me, that is... But some people the, pump, some people are, uh, are using FireMaker from their um, home office, uh, logging into a local client where the remote uh, tools get the modifier keys stuck down. So I've had problems with modifier keys because... Uh, oh, yeah. sometimes yeah, the modifier the keys get stuck down. down. But if you're so, going to the requester and say, hey, make sure your caps lock key is off, hold down the shift yeah. key, then you can test this. I guess the, a shortcoming with that is that that doesn't work on FileMaker Go, right? If you're doing a FileMaker Go desk, yeah. you'll have to do a little more elaborate work around, have a hidden button or something like that. But um, hey, anyway. Chris. Yeah. Uh, question about the scripts. So you're, you're modifying a script. Um, how quick is the script uh, updated on the client? So as, soon as, as soon as you save it, is that, is that user like pressing that button and running that script? It's like uh, server saying, okay, this user is needing a new, a new version of the script. So I need to send it to him before they run it. How quick is that? Or do they have to log out and log back in? As, as, long, as far as I know, it's instantaneously. As, as long as you're not running it for the moment. Okay, exactly. that was my experience. I, I've seen a lot of lag on layouts being pushed out to people who are sitting on the layout, but the script, as long as they're not in the middle of it, executing it, if they push a button and it then calls the script, I get the new script immediately. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've seen the same there, thing with layouts. There was, there was uh, I can't remember whether that was a particular version of FileMaker that came out, but there was some trouble at some point with... Um, editing of scripts and uh, when you save it, some live running scripts got an update of the script while it was still running under some conditions. I don't know whether it was when they paused or uh, when you've got a, if it's a subscript. I think like it was if, I think, I think it was, I think it was server scripts. I think it was server scripts because we had this with those server scripts at once so that they started sometime in the middle of it updating. Okay. But we, I, we have had that. We have had the one situation of that where we've edited a script and in the middle of a process, um, the it went you know from, from line five to line six and uh, between line five and line six, it was a completely different script. And so it was somewhere completely different because we'd inserted something at the beginning. We've had that. I, can't, I cannot remember what the conditions were that whatever, occurred the, in. Of, Russell, whatever the problem was, uh, I have situations now where on the server, I have scripts that are in a, in, a, in a loop waiting and doing subscripts. I can even edit those subscripts on the client. Um, and as soon as the, 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 the server side script has to branch into that subscript, it's, it's loading in the new, the new script. It's really, even in a paused situation, it's reloading the script, the new script. So it's whatever the bug was, it's solved. Russell, whatever, whenever that happens, that's called user error. <laughs> All right, we're, we're getting close on time. Let me try and rush through some of these uh, last few slides here. So value lists, if I have, you know, active, inactive, and I want to add hyperactive to the value list, adding that new value is fine. It doesn't change anything that existed. Um, so I, I, it's generally fine as long as you don't have any script dependencies on these values. Like, oh, if this value list item says this and I'm changing active to current or something like that, um, you always need to look out for dependencies. And I, I think that's sort of something that we all intuitively grasp, but I, I just wanted to state it for the record. Um, if you have a value list that is based on a table where the value lists actually have IDs attached to them, so you can change the name of the value while the key is preserved. Um, that's generally okay. And again, you might have you know, some hack in there where you have a script dependency saying, hey, look for this value as opposed to an ID or something like that. Um, and then the other possible problem with changing value lists is if you have like a report 
that sub summarizes by some value and you know you've changed the, the valueless value and all of a sudden at this demarcation point all the new value the new records going forward will have a different value from legacy values and you're trying to do year over year comparisons you might have to go back and clean up some of that legacy data just for reporting consistency so it's just you know th this isn't even about development anymore it's about data hygiene and making sure your data is clean and fits the current state of the system um, and then I wanted to touch on doing bulk updates of legacy data because there's all sorts of implications to this and it sort of feels like a no brainer after you've made a feature change, but there's all sorts of pitfalls here. And so anytime you're like populating a flag field that you just added or adjusting uh, value list values, you're going to trigger any modification date and time stamps that you have in the system. Um, and it's possible, you know, some people have um, conditional time stamping. They'll say, hey, if this uh, global variable is set to suspend timestamps while I do some big update, you know, that works as far as it goes. Um, and it'll only affect your session. But if you have something like HIPAA or ISO compliant rules, you know, HIPAA has to log when a record was touched. So it needs to know. And if you're relying on things like who is the last person to modify this thing and you've um, compromised that logic, that might be a HIPAA violation. And so they can't, you know, if that is in the system, they can say, well, how would we ever know if a developer access patient data, if the developer has the ability to sort of cover their footprints. And so these are just sort of problematic issues that I don't have a great answer for. Uh, maybe you just say, you know, yes, I, the developer, had to do a bulk update of all this data and it's logged and so be it. But that might be a situation where you don't want to um, suppress uh, modification timestamps from uh, running. Um, and as a suggestion here, I say, you know, you could just run it all server side where you can say, well, I can prove I didn't do it because the server did it. And so the server runs headless, so therefore I couldn't have seen anything. Um, Another situation is you could create a one-to-one -one relationship to a, another table that has timestamps in it and that you keep the times the timestamps over there and then you have some sort of alternative logic that updates those there and then you setting a flag field in the main table wouldn't affect those you it would be more event driven as opposed to automatic from filemaker so it's a little bit of a can of worms. It's not terrible, but it's just stuff to keep in mind if you have to go back and massage data to fit your new feature. Um, script considerations, and this could be a little bit of a longer discussion, but we're tight on time. So let me try and rush through it. Um, in general, my experience is that if it's a brand new script, I don't care. I'm happy to just knock it in live. It's not gonna affect anything. Um, if I have a dev system up, as uh, Peter mentioned, you know, I can just sort of copy and paste it from the dev system and make that impact, uh, you know, minimal. If I have to change the way an existing script functions, though, then I have a lot finer grain process that I go through, and I say, okay, am I going to disrupt any, you know, if someone's mid script on, you know, a, a long script that does a series of operations, am I going to disrupt anybody if I change that? Yes or no. Um, I could import it, but maybe transplant steps. Uh, I, you know, a great practice is to duplicate the scripts, test the changes there, make sure everything works. And you know, as soon as you go through all these questions, if you get a whiff that this might be a problem, then the answer is wait till everybody's out of the system and do this change after hours if you can. Uh, otherwise, you have to kick people out. Um, and, you know, we talked about, oh, wouldn't it suck if uh, we made some change and the, the user didn't detect it or we got a blank serial number or something like that. I think as, you know, collectively, we're not great at testing operations that we expect to work, like new record. How often have you stuck an error trap after a new record and said, make sure that new, that new record happened? Um, you know, frequently, if you're talking to an ODBC system and you make a new record and it's trying to talk to a related value and that hangs up and says, I can't go anywhere because it's done, you have to revert. And if you revert that, what I've found is you get a gap in the serial number. It consumes that serial number. It will revert. It will destroy the record, but the serial number is already incremented. And so now you have a hole in your serial number. And so yeah, if that's, you're uh, that's, that's, that's that option in the field definitions where you have 
on create or on commit, that's where you choose that. Yes. Yeah. So if you're in a situation where you get yes. audited from time to time, then you have to take that approach. And so, yes, Peter, great point. Does anybody at all use uh, on commit for serial numbers? No. Ever? Never. Anybody? Without a serial number, you can't do any um, sub sub records. Well, like, I've okay, used it in a couple in a couple of cases, but not very often. And it was a long, long time ago. Yeah, I, I think the answer is, as always, it depends. There are situations for both. What would be a good case to use it? I don't know, but and well, uh, begin how, may use the transaction. how bad is it to lose a serial number? Generally not, but sometimes oh. it is. The bigger problem <laughs> is the bigger problem is that if you have clients that are working remotely with weak connections and they create the serial numbers on on a new record and not on commit, they might create double IDs because they're not communicating fast enough with each other. Really? Wow. Well, that would yeah. be a serious file maker, but I've I've had Very. that with a system that is that is heavily used over Wi-Fi and over cellular network, and I had to change all IDs to UUID numbers for that reason. Bitquirks did some reporting on a very interesting, uh, unique value validation bug as well. I think that might be related. Also, I mean, there are certain bugs. I don't know if it's still around in nineteen, but. The problem was locking the record, I guess. Uh, not uh, especially the serial number, but um, the Did problem was that uh, two people could lock the same record. That was uh, the issue. Uh, that was, yeah, you're right. I added a link to the chat from Chris Irvine. It's a, a solution for some of these record number incrementing issues. Cool, thanks. Thanks. All right, let's move along. Someone's in the waiting room. There we go. Just a, one one last comment on the uh, serial number issues. Uh, we've had duplicated uh, IDs simply where two different um, users are importing uh, records into the same target file. Um, we've had some situations where uh, an ID is is doubly given. All right. Uh, two slides left here. Let me just uh, rush through these. So if uh, oops, I keep getting uh, tons of people coming in to the admit. Um, you know, the big question, and again, if there's a whiff of trouble on any of these, then I'm going to defer to an after hours change. Um, but still in the live system. Um, if the change is going to modify a business process, if it could possibly leave someone who's partway through the process stranded in any way, or if you think there's the remotest possibility, don't do it. Um, you, you can try and block users from accessing the feature for some time so you get everybody trickling out of the queue and so you know you have a clear field to work with. Um, and I gave a quick example here of you know, what if you had to add an acceptance of terms to the beginning of a transaction and closing the transaction required some yes terms have been accepted flag. Um, if you added that in midstream and someone had not been presented those terms and then tried to close the transaction and said, hey, you never did your, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, and I'll, uh, an approach to dealing with situations like that, especially if these things play out over several days and we're not talking minutes or seconds. You can say, you know, if a transaction uh, was begun under the old regime, then it gets grandfathered in if it has this start date or earlier. So you can do things like that. And then this is the last slide here. So my general um, philosophy is if it's a brand new layout, I have no trouble adding it in the live system. Um, if I'm going to add layouts to our fields to a layout, the screen jump is a problem. So I like to duplicate the layout first, yeah. mush it around, get complete yeah. buy-in. So I'm sure that the thing is absolutely solid and that we're not going to be tweaking it. Um, and tweaking can, I, it. can I ask a very stupid small question? Sure. Is there anybody who knows how to keep a file maker from making the new blue ugly layouts? 
uh, because I'm 19, it makes those ugly layouts, and I'm the, the theme. The theme is is completely wrong. Uh, can can you keep it from generating that blue theme when you make a new layout? That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, CSS I think if you create a new layout from a layout that has a different theme, doesn't it create? Doesn't it use the theme of the layout you were on? No. Yeah. It's for, the, for the same device, on the same latest version, you get the the ugly uh, apex blue uh, apex blue yes theme. It's so horrible. so then the tip is to create a layout, duplicate it, and change the table occurrence. Just just create a blank layout, nothing else on it. That's what I do. Well, it doesn't seem to work, but anyone knows a systematic system to no, change the default new layout it, of a file? That in, a, we... in an existing file, not for a new file, I think there's no way to avoid it uh, when you create a new file, but in an existing file, as far as I know, it remembers the team that you last used for the same device. Um, that's for an existing file. I think that's in the docs. It may be a good idea to ask Matt Petrowski since he uh, created that, that theme. So he has a deeper knowledge when this comes into uh, effect. And, but yeah. Well, I, I just did it on, on a file of mine. I, on a layout with a different theme, if you do a new layout, it uses the theme of the layout you were on. But with the first, uh, when you create a solution, the very first is always the Apex. Yeah, the very first one is always but there. I think if you make a new table in the file, and then it generates a new layout automatically, that one is again in Apex Blue. Yeah. That's the new beautiful standard. But there's a big difference from uh, using the uh, new layout command from the uh, just, uh, well, command can't remember the command but, uh, from the uh, menu. And then if you open up the layouts palette, if you open up the layouts palette, then you probably always get the Apex Blue. But if you do it uh, from the menus, you, you should get a new layout with the same theme as uh, the one you are uh, currently at. As, uh, as Joss says, all right, three, three bullet points left and we can all get out of dodge here. Okay, so if a field is uh, maintained elsewhere or it's slated for deletion, I don't care about yanking a field off a layout. You know, maybe people are used to seeing it there. I, I'm very reluctant to move the cheese on somebody. So if they're used to seeing, you know, the uh, name in the top left corner and buttons on the right or something like that, I always try and maintain relative positioning to the extent that I can because you really mess with people's groove if you uh, uh, get in there and just sort of capriciously move things around. So I always try to avoid any significant rearranging of layouts that are used uh, frequently um, and preserve the relative position. So I am way over time. So if anybody has any questions, just throw them in the chat. Um, Egbert, do you want to introduce the next speaker? Or?